moment in the service when usually somebody shares some words of Torah because, of course, we are people of the book and we share words of Torah when we come together because it's interesting and stimulating and important. But a very important form of Torah is somebody's life story. Life story, as it, as, as it were. <laughs> right? And like... And it's a common thing to say, oh, a person's Torah, you know, like Rabbi Stephen's Torah is a Torah of dignity, you know, like almost everything he says in some way comes back to that, you know, right, <laughs> right? It's, and it's actually kind of, a, it's a powerful thing to figure out, you know, like what it, you know, like what's, what's my Torah? Um, the holiday of Simcha Torah is coming up and, and for many people, like the, the Torah coming full circle is an opportunity to ask like, what's my life's Torah? What's my story? And how, and, and how do I tell my story through how I live, through how I talk, through how I preach, through what I speak? And so uh, we have a guest today um, in, the spirit of, in the spirit of the holiday of Sukkot, inviting people into our sukkah. Um, inviting people in, and so Rep Rabbi Jonathan Mendoza, do you want do you want me to you want to just wear it for the night? Uh, just take it. So Jonathan Mendoza is, and I can I read your bio and embarrass you? An award-winning, Boston-bred, Chicago-based Jewish educator and Mexican-American activist, spoken word poet, social justice educator, and musician. Yes, he is. Wait, I'm not done though. You can clap. He is the National Poetry Slam competition, three-time award winner at the College Union Poetry Slam Invitational, and winner of the Sonia Sanchez Langston Hughes Poetry Prize. His work has been featured in HuffPost, the Boston Globe, Flama, the Poetry Foundation, and NPR. It's, yeah? But wait, there's more. Jonathan has organized across the United States with local and national movements around migration justice, economic justice, democratization, and policing. He currently serves as community organizer for housing justice and youth power with the Pilsen Alliance in Chicago's Lower West Side. Jonathan is a Berklee College of Music graduate with a self-designed bachelor degree in arts for social advocacy and minors in political science and spoken word poetry. It's really cool when you can go to college and you can minor in spoken word poetry. Um, Jonathan ties the artistic to the political, the academic to the emotional, providing galvanizing content for a variety of audiences and making him a rising star in the word of spoken word poetry. Jonathan, we are so glad to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. And I turn the floor to you. I turn it over to you. Um, sometimes when you're like six years out of college, you forget like, oh yeah, I did do that. That's the thing I did. Um, hey everyone. Hi. How's it going? Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Um, let me get my, my thing set up here. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. I, um, I haven't been in this space before. Uh, so I, I have to admit, I have to update my bio, embarrassingly. <laughs> but I'm no longer uh, a, a staff member with Pilsen Alliance, but I do love them very dearly. I'm actually um, in Nashville, Tennessee currently. And so uh, to be back in Chicago, uh, and be in one of my very strong roots, though I grew up in Boston, I feel like, I always say like I cut my teeth in Chicago, that's the, that's the phrase, right? But I like to say like I trimmed my bangs or something, I don't know, just change it up a little bit. I did get a haircut today, thank you for noticing. Um, but uh, it, it's just like such a pleasure to be here. I've heard so many wonderful things about Mitch Khan, um, and I'm seeing it all in person live, so thank you for, for creating this space and inviting me in. Um, so it seems like there's already a vibe of like communal connection and just connecting with strangers and just like loving up on each other. Do I get that sense already? Yeah. Yes, beautiful, perfect, we'll make this work. Um, so in the spirit of that, uh, I would love for y'all to, th Tennessee, there's gonna be a lot of y'all. I was there for like two months, it's already infected me. <laughs> um, turn to someone near you who you don't know super well uh, and I want you to, one, introduce yourself however you feel comfortable. That can be brief. And then, two, I'm going to teacher mode. Two, uh, what brings you here, right? And maybe you can invoke, are there people who bring you here, people in the space, people no longer with us, um, memories? Are there, uh, is there something about this place, this space in particular that brings you back? Whatever it is, try to include detail, right? Share a little bit of yourself with that person you're meeting. The last thing I want to ask y'all to ask each other, how do you persevere through challenging conversations? How do you persevere through challenging conversations? Okay, so pop quiz. The first one is, first question is, introduce yourself, perfect. Second question, 
You got it. Third question. Wow, this section, this is, I feel like it, there was a college, right? A co okay, that's what it is. These college students are like, we got this. Um, cool. So uh, go ahead, turn to someone you don't know super well and get started. We'll do like three or four minutes in total. All right. Teacher voice is coming in. There you go. <laughs> I love this conversation. I love this conversation. So we're going to we're going to keep the conversation going but as a group. So if you can turn back away from your new best friends, I'm sorry. I love it. It's the best problem to have when people want to keep talking. Um, awesome, awesome. So how was meeting your new best friends? How was that? Good? Beautiful. So uh, I want to get like a few folks to chime in um, with sharing back a little bit on what they talked about. But it's not going to be like a general everything they discussed, everything I discussed. Um, instead, I want to focus on what did you have in common, okay? What did you have in common? So that can be for any of the questions. It can be anything with your introduction, something you connected with the other person. Uh, it can be you have something similar uh, that brings you here. Or also it can be a way that you have in common, of ways that you persevere through challenging conversation. Just feel free to toss up a hand. She had an interesting conversation. I feel like everyone did because people want to keep talking. There it is. I'll go one and then two. Go ahead. Awesome. Both committed to working on these challenging conversations. Can I ask, what does that look like for y'all? I love that. So what I heard, for, could people hear for the most part? Not really. Not really? Okay. So <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to try to uh, do, do a little interpretation here. So um, being open to listening fully and not simply waiting to provide an answer, um, I think also carries into what you said later about not needing to ask every question, not being able to ask every question, um, and also that sometimes your question asking can often redirect the focus of someone's story onto yourself. Um, so a theme I got from that was a lot of just openness to, to receiving someone's story, receiving someone's perspective um, and narrative, and that being crucial. Awesome. And how about over here? That didn't come up in conversation? Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, you'll have to talk about that later. Awesome. Awesome. Um, cool. So I'm going to get into it. Um, I think... I'm going to talk about this in a sec because I have some words written down, but I also want to share more informally. Um, this is always a hard time of the year for me, <laughs> and, and you'll hear in a little bit why, uh, but given my identity and given how I grew up, um, particularly with regard to race, class, ethnicity, being a biracial Jew with a mestizo, very low wealth father, and a white upper middle class Ashkenazi mother, um, being in Jewish spaces had been a really big challenge for me. It continues often to this day to be completely transparent with you. Uh, and that's a lot of what I write about. That's a lot of what I share about. Um, and also, uh, transparently, again, um, being in Jewish spaces and having developed a lot of very close, loving relationships and friendships with, with Palestinian friends, um, and that being something that it makes it challenging for me in, in many Jewish spaces um, today. And so I want to be open and honest with that about y'all as I continue to share a bit more on my story. But my hope is that we can receive and kind of like we just heard from here, and I'm sure a lot of great conversation happened elsewhere, um, leaning on each other for support, right? Identifying who are those loved ones in your life. Maybe they're here in this room. Maybe it's someone you can process with later that you can rely on to be someone you can speak to, to process something that felt challenging or difficult, um, and also uh, being open to receiving. My hope is that you can all receive 
my story with generosity and grace, I absolutely extend the same to you, and I can't wait to dine together and hear some more about each of you all. Um, and there will be hopefully be some moments for me to hear from you as we move forward, even with this session right now. Uh, does that sound good with everyone? Yeah. Beautiful. Love it. Love it. Um, so it's going to be a mix. It's going to be a mix of me um, sharing some written words I prepared for y'all and then some of my poems. Um, so I'll start sharing a little bit about my story. So my name is Jonathan. Uh, I am a community organizer, an educator, and as you'll hear shortly, a poet. A lot, or I'd say the bulk of my work, revolves around challenging ourselves and each other with regard to our experiences, perspectives, biases, and powers and privileges we may or may not hold. Tonight, I am delighted to be able to share a bit of my narrative, including my poetry, on my experience with my identity, particularly as a biracial Latinx Jew, and stimulate an ongoing conversation about inclusive and equitable Jewish community. And transparently, my experiences relate to many moments of challenge within Jewish community regarding race, ethnicity, language, and politics. And as my therapist would be so very proud of me for uplifting, when these guttural instinctive reactions come to us when we hear about moments of challenge, maybe words, perspectives um, that challenge us, my hope is that we can accept these feelings in ourselves as entirely valid and not to be fought, but acknowledged, heard, and worked with. Um, some grounding techniques that I love employing is maybe taking some uh, deep counted breaths, breathing in through your nose for six seconds, holding in your belly for three, and then out your mouth for three. Um, we can practice that later. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I hope using practices like that, we can guide ourselves to just be as physically present as we can here so that we can also be mentally and spiritually open to e receiving each other's narratives. Um, so before I jump in, I want to give a huge thank you to Rebecca. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for uh, organizing this event and for inviting me in. And of course, oh, she's upstairs. We got clapped super loud next time. So, uh, <laughs> of course, to Rabbi Lizzie and everyone here for um, leading us in this beautiful, beautiful service. It's such a joy to be a part of. Um, and to all the Mishkan staff and leaders and volunteers for creating this space. Uh, and also for you, you could have chosen to be anywhere tonight, and you chose to be here, so give yourselves a little <laughs> pat on the back for that. Um, and also to the often overlooked work of the uh, custodial and cleaning services of this building who have maintained a beautiful, mm -hmm. lovely space for us to be in. Mm -hmm. um, now, who here has heard of a land acknowledgement, just by a show of hands? A land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement. Okay, so kind of half and half it seems like. Um, so I want to offer a land acknowledgement and then just share a few words on that as well. Um, it is a practice that originated with Aboriginal um, tribes in Canada that has kind of spread across other colonized places across the world. Um, but really in this moment, it's a, a more somber but intentional acknowledgement to the land that we currently gather on and on the native peoples whose autonomy and sovereignty um, our communities often undermine uh, in, in the aftermath of, of very tragically violent colonization that is ongoing in many ways. Um, so we are here today on what is colonially referred to as Chicago, Illinois, formerly known as Chicago, in an area of the unceded lands of the Peoria, Miami, and Potawatomi peoples, the traditional stewards of this land. Um, if you're coming from somewhere else, you can also go to a website that's native-land.ca. It's an amazing, amazing tool where you can identify uh, all these anthropologists and native scholars and researchers have mapped out the, the former um, tribes that uh, had lived in that land prior to colonization, and you can find out whose land you occupy. Um, and I think it's really apt, especially in this moment of Sukkot, when we are often thinking about land and appreciation of the abundance that land uh, and resources afford us to also acknowledge the harms and complications that come with that. Um, and so with an acknowledgement, I think it can be dangerously self-aggrandizing to only acknowledge um, our complicity with harm and, and let that be it. Uh, the metaphor I tried to stitch through here is it would be as though to steal someone's house and kick them out and then acknowledge that you have done so 
without ever returning the house. <laughs> so I hope that this can be acknowledgement as a, as a first step in um, decolonizing and, and achieving a more just and liberated world that we can all happily partake in. Does that sound good? Beautiful. So um, I will highlight Uplift Shy Nations Youth Council. If you go to shynations.org, that's an amazing group of young people right here in Chicago, all indigenous leaders um, who are working on very tangible policies for how the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois can um, achieve equity with the native peoples that it has displaced. Uh, also, landback.org is a wonderful, wonderful um, campaign to do similar work nationally. And do y'all want to hear a poem? I think it's time. I think it's time. I, I was telling Rabbi Lizzie, I was like, every time I like had a new thought for what I want to share tonight, I wrote it down, and now it's like 10,000 pages long. So you'll have to read the book later. Brown Boy, White Boy, after Angel Nafis and John Sands. Biracial boy in social justice seminar is asked to join a racial affinity group. People of color or white. White boy does not want to infiltrate safe space for people of color. Brown boy does not want to keep white people from having honest, constructive dialogue. Biracial boy does not know what he is. Recalls posting a survey on Facebook in middle school asking how people categorize him that would determine his clothes, his music, how we spoke. Biracial boy wishes the skin came with an instruction manual. Brown boy tells the white boy he should not identify as a person of color, that he can pass, that he should not appropriate a struggle that is not his. White boy tells brown boy that he will not identify as white, erase the brown from his blood, will not be the one who finishes the colonization of his own body. White boy visits family in Mexico, realizes he is the whitest intruder since conquistadors. Brown boy goes to white synagogue, is in the only family not invited to the dinner party. Biracial boy is welcome everywhere. Biracial boy is not welcome anywhere. Biracial boy is tug of war, but biracial boy is both sets of hands pulling at each end, and biracial boy is sorry for this poem, for taking up space, does not know if it's his white self that's doing so, if it's even letting the brown self speak. White boy apologizes for his privilege. Brown boy resents white boy for taking up so much space with apologies. White boy says, I'm sorry. Brown boy says, you're doing it again. Brown boy hates his white, this legacy like shingles all over his face. White boy gone, but biracial boy to brown family is still white, still looks like Goyote. Biracial boy is both the discolored sheep of each family and the dog that hunts it. Wishes he were purebred and not a mutt. Brown boy asks white boy what it's like not to get profiled, to go to your cousin's wedding in Arizona and feel safe. White boy goes to white barbecue, meets white cop. White cop does not know boy is biracial, starts talking immigration policy. Brown boy screams, hides inside white skin, white skin silent. White skin shield, white boy protector, white boy savior. But brown boy does not need white savior, strikes back at white self, but biracial boy during Latinx uprising does not know if he should sit down or speak up to which army society has drafted him. Biracial boy is tug of war, but biracial boy is the rope, is frank, cannot hold his selves together. Biracial boy hates being two different selves recalls it's the world that made him this way, that split him in half, held oppressor and oppressed, insect and the boot, and biracial boy is both of them. I, I started reading half the book, so we're going to pull a little audible. I'm going to just share a little bit more on my story, and then we're just going to do some poems. Is that cool? Yeah. Love it, love it. Um, so my abuelo was born in a train station in Durango, Mexico. Uh, when I would ask him of his, pa of his past, he'd always remember to recount the same details. How his first crib was a wooden bench with a pile of straw. How his father, Juan Mendoza, 
was Wirarica and a merchant. He would travel across the region, helping manage a few small shops and businesses. It was in Zacatecas where Juan met my bisabuela, Victoria. She passed when my, when my abuelo was young, but there were key details that remained with him. That she played music, she had pale skin, light eyes, and dark curly hair, and that her last name was some combination of Guzman and Stein. My abuelo doesn't remember the country her family came from, but he remembers her closing the blinds on Friday nights, lighting two candles on the center table, and muttering a small prayer in any language who's too young to know. It's the tale of many, the crypto Jews, those who held tradition and lineage in secret from the days of the Spanish Inquisition, legacies that institutionalized anti-Semitism in the formerly indigenous lands that would be colonized and termed Latin America. My abuelo carried these memories to Chihuahua, where he would meet my abuelita, and to my father, who would be born there. It was this knowledge of Jewish heritage in my father's line that enabled him to marry my mother. My mother was born in Mount Vernon, New York. Her parents were descendants of Polish and Russian Jews who settled in New York and Connecticut. The story is perhaps the more familiar one. Ashkenazi Jews who fled Eastern Europe to escape economic hardship, seek greater financial opportunity in the colonized United States, and to flee the always intensifying onslaught of pogroms, raids carried across Eastern Europe in tandem with the politically strategic vilification and scapegoating of Jewish people. Then came me. I was born outside of Boston, raised in central Massachusetts, grew up in a white suburb of a multiracial town with white and Latinx and immigrant friends and plenty of multiracial confusion and reckoning with assimilation, but also joyous multicultural celebration. I was raised in a kosher, religiously conservative Jewish household. We made sure that tamales were of chicken only and no pork. We put cilantro and chipotle in our matzo ball soup and dipped corn tortillas that we brought home from Santa Fe. My abuelo sang a Mexican rendition of Java Nagila for my bubby and Zadie's wedding anniversary. And without sensationalizing or exotifying multicultural experience, I can say that the unique nature of my upbringing was at times isolating and at times celebratory, a feeling perhaps many here can resonate with. I descend from brown mestices and white Jews. Sometimes I open Twitter and see people who look like my family being put in cages by people who look like my family. The act is the subject of a Facebook debate being had by people who look like my family. There's video of a Mexican-American woman, someone who looks like my family, speaking with an accent of someone who sounds like my family, holding a cell phone camera to the faces of a family migrating. The family has a story that sounds like my family's. The Mexican-American woman shouts at them, telling them to go back. She asks them why, if they are proud Americans, they are covering their faces. The migrating family does not reply, but I imagine they have voices that sound like my family's. They do not remove the garbs from their faces, but the skin of their hands resembles those of my family's. 30% of people who may or may not look like my family voted for a president who may or may not look like my family. At times, I see people defend this human vigilante border. These people look like both of my families. They say this is needed to prevent crime. I imagine the image appearing in their heads is of someone who looks like my family, but glossed in ink stitches, crossing with guns and killing people who look like their family. Sometimes this is the image that appears in my head too. I don't believe they've ever developed the image of someone who looks like my family being killed by someone who looks like my family in a place below this border, far away from their family. My father once said he wished for all the gangbangers to enter a great open field and to unleash their vendettas onto each other's bodies so that we, who are not gangbangers, could live peacefully. I cannot say for certain if he remembers that they have families and siblings, and parents, and elders, and loved ones, who may or may not look like our family.
share one more. While we gather to celebrate Sukkot, I recognize that we also meet shortly after the Jewish New Year, a time that for me has signified a period of reflection for my personal life and how I strive to live. I believe that through reflection, through remembrance, we can connect our ancestries and lineages of suffering and complicity to the space, time, and bodies we occupy. I remember being eight, reflecting on the rabbi's sermon during Rosh Hashanah that referenced civil rights leaders in the U.S. and apartheid South Africa. I remember turning to my mother and stating bluntly, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to devote my life to justice. But despite Jewish spaces being foundational to this passion, it was these very spaces that over time came to seem so limited in their capacity to create context for reflection, to paint the broad picture of the complexities of Jewish American assimilation, white supremacy, privilege, Zionism, imperialism, classism, and complicity. I often felt alone in those spaces, ones replete with wealthy white families who I felt were so distantly removed from the struggles and experiences of friends and family, those who were first generation people of color and working class. The remembrance of my family history and even recent and current struggles in my bloodline, I empathize so much more closely with the people being forced to migrate, being expelled from one home and then another, having their economically oppressed neighborhoods then ravaged by war. I empathize with those who are punished so wholly and severely as retribution for the actions of a few, experiences faced by many around the world who were not in these spaces or connected to them. How could I not? And as I grew older and developed awareness of global inequity and suffering that my very communities were complicit in, particularly as I became close to Palestinian people and learned of the Palestinian struggle, I became largely disconnected not only from these spaces but from Judaism entirely. And I want to emphasize here that the focus of my activism and community organizing regarding migration and of the migrant justice movement, in my opinion, is to confront those in power who control the movement and the existence of others through violence. Through this framework, migrant justice, prison abolition, gender justice, Palestinian liberation, indigenous sovereignty, and decolonization, and so much more become intrinsically linked. I consider how Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio's police department the Chicago Police Department, the Israeli Defense Force, the U.S. Police, Military and Immigration Enforcement, and more all collude continuously to bolster these apparatuses of violence. I encourage everyone who's become stirred and passionate about social justice in recent years to dig into these connections, to organize and operate intersectionally and internationally in every imaginable way, and to know that we are often fighting the same beast simply from many different angles. Upon remembering this, my, experience, my family's experiences, hardships, and privileges through migration, and the economic conditions much of my family currently endures in Mexico, where U.S. neoliberalism, militarization, and criminalization has hindered social justice throughout the country's history, I try to root myself in causes for liberation globally. When I discovered radical Jewish spaces, such as Jewish Voices for Peace, If Not Now, and many more, Spaces that fully recall the interconnectedness between the freedom struggles of the Jewish diaspora with the struggles for black, Palestinian, indigenous, and migrant liberation, I began feeling that Judaism, my Judaism, my spirituality, culture, and religion could be capable of remembering our collective past in its entirety and using this remembrance as a scripture to guide, to guide our collective futures. This is what brought me back to Judaism. I'm gonna share one more poem, and in summary of the rest of my book that will be available Sunday, um, I had a wonderful conversation with Rabbi Lizzie about the connection between my story and Sukkot and what it meant um, to have ch challenging conversations in this container specifically. And it was a beautiful reflection that we talked about um, the opportunity we're afforded by living in a period of abundance. Um, that in celebrating the abundance of the harvest, of this gathering of food that we're gonna have, of thanks to the land, uh, this is a time when we maybe 
feel like we can afford to have some of those more challenging conversations where we can maybe engage with someone from a different perspective or whether it's Jews from a different background, a racialized background, Jews like myself who felt very um, pushed out of Jewish spaces for a long period of my life, and with non-Jews, um, reckoning with race and class and Zionism in complicated and intense ways uh, allow us to read into different histories, into different perspectives, different narratives, have conversations with Palestinian and indigenous and black uh, neighbors and community members and be able to have and carry those complicated conversations in this environment of abundance. When we're in scarcity mode all the time and we feel like I'm gonna protect me and mine and the close ones around me, that can be a really tough moment for us to have a very vulnerable conversation. Do folks agree with that? Mm -hmm. Have people been there before? Yes. I know I have for sure. Yeah. Um, but hopefully when we enter this new year with the spirit of abundance, um, the sukkah is big enough for all of us, mm. yeah? Um, so I'd like to close with this poem, uh, reflecting a little bit on that. Um, and yeah, let's see. This technology is such a blessing and curse, let's see. Same thing happened to me on Kol Nidre. Oh yes, every time, every time. <laughs> Confessions on Gratitude. My father tells me of Chihuahua, his birthplace, of women selling roses on street corners to remain alive, of children washing cars or selling mangoes with no shoes. He tells me how he came to the US when he was 10, of how lucky he was to obtain a green card from his father's new wife, how his father obtained one from his boss, he tells me of the rotting car he drove from Arizona to Boston, how lucky he was for it to not break down, how it was here where he would meet my mother, find a job, have children, how everything I am, I am because of good luck. And I am to be grateful for my existence, sure, but sometimes I wonder if Chihuahua is the greatest exporter of good luck. Bad luck never gets anywhere. Bad luck always drowns in the Rio Grande, or shot halfway up the fence by an immigration officer. But good luck, good luck gets the affirmative action scholarship. Good luck applied for citizenship at the right time. I do not believe anyone died because they were not strong. I believe I survived because I was lucky. I'm lucky because the indigenous woman forced to bear me Staring down the eye of a Spaniard's gun did not end herself before starting me. I'm lucky because my Jewish family fled Russia before the raids began. Because my Jewish family fled Poland before the raids began. Because my Jewish family fled Spain before the raids began. Because my Mexican family's green cards arrived after the raids began. And I do not get to disassociate myself from those who are undocumented just because I have the fortune of being documented. I'm not joyful for good luck. Good luck implies the death of everyone who does not have it. I cannot celebrate good luck in a graveyard. I blow out the birthday candles, and each year I survive is a year someone did not. I walk to school unbombed. I go to bed undeported. I hit the bar undroned. I'm everything the ground did not bury. I want a victory out of this, but I don't know what candles to offer the ghost beside me. I want a cake, a party, balloons, a gift basket. I want it all entering the earth when they did. I am to be grateful for my existence, sure, but gratitude is a Cold War's reparation away from justice. Gratitude does not lift up the dead, does not spill the life back into a mother. I want to be alive and well and joyous, but if I knew the world like a cousin, I'd know death like a twin. There is a boy somewhere with my name, and he does not get to write this poem. I write this poem because I am not him, but here, alive, so lucky. Thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you, Jonathan. If people want to speak with Jonathan after services, so we are having dinner upstairs. Many of you are registered to come. If you're not, I think we have some spaces available still. And inspired by you sharing your Torah, many folks in the community are actually going to share a little bit of their Torah tonight. And maybe you will too over dinner. Thank you so much for bringing your perspective, your story, and the opportunity to interrogate our own reactions and thoughts to the things that you shared, um, which I hope people will do tonight and for many weeks and months and years to come. And I hope this isn't the only time you visit us. Um, we are going to stand and close out our service. Yeah. Do people want to get like one more? One more round of applause? Yeah. All right, we're on page 32. <laughs> Shalom, Sam Halkinu Kaham, Vegora Lenu Kehol Hamonam, Vealamu Kori, Shahalim Mumodim, Lipne Malach, Malcheam Lachim, Hakadosh Faruchu. The bottom of thirty two. Oh